ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul and in the Shrig Game to Com video we're going to be discussing the arm dynamic which is big little core taken to the absolute extreme as well as touching on the GTX 1080 tie overclocking where it has hit a pretty impressive record of 3 gigahertz but we'll get into that last. So arm of course processors are well synonymous with technology right now. They are found in everything from smartphones down to high power devices. ARM has changed its design over multiple years. Initially we had single processors and then of course we started to pair those processors and finally moved into quad-core processors. But while that was very important for performance side of things, batteries started to suffer. So what um, ARM decided to do was then introduce the big little architecture. For those who don't know, it's simply having two different types of ARM core on the same design, typically pairing them together so you have a high performance cluster and also a high efficiency cluster. The idea with this is that power consumption can be lowered when you're not using a task which requires loads of energy and of course things can change on a whim. So what have ARM done? Well, they're now focusing on performance, efficiency, and scalability, as well as latency. So what we're starting to see is a larger cluster paradigm. So what we can start seeing is up to eight cores per cluster. And the really beautiful thing about these is you can start having variable core designs with these clusters. So in theory, you could start having different processor families in the same SOC. There are some questions which aren't actually answered uh, mostly regarding how cache hierarchy and how cache works between these different cores, but I'm assuming we're going to find that information over the next couple of months. The whole key to this, however, is a new fabric, and this has additional power saving and overall lowers the latency associated with accessing data. In theory, we'll also see better voltage and frequency as well as sleep states, and from what we can tell, the processor hierarchy will allow greater choices and simply five things for everyone involved. Interestingly as well, ARM are focusing a lot on artificial intelligence, which is not exactly new, considering most companies now are really pushing towards AI. However, according to ARM, with Dynamic, which is Dynam and then IQ, AI computations will be up to 50 times faster in five years which is absolutely insane. The purpose behind this is it will reduce the amount of time spent between devices and cloud communications. So for example, if the system itself, in other words, your handheld device or whatever can actually process more data, that means that in turn, the cloud doesn't need to do so much work. In other words, it's quite simply that if your device has done most of the calculations before it sends that request off to the cloud, it can be a lot faster, which obviously, despite the fact that mobile communications are becoming quicker, that's not necessarily the only um, factor. So, for example, if you're in an area with spotty Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter how fast your device is under best conditions. And this is particularly going to be important if you start moving towards you know, dr um, driverless cars and those type of usages. I admit, as a primarily PC slash console gamer, this doesn't necessarily super interest me on the whole, but you do have to remember that ARM are not just producing the processors for the Samsung Galaxies. They are basically one of the largest producers of um, processors in the world at this point, and servers are even starting to move towards um, ARM CPUs. Not exclusively by any stretch of the imagination. Microsoft, for example, are using ARM as one of their processor partners, not the only one. And you're also starting to see x86 uh, emulation become quite snappy. So technically you can run Windows 10 quite well on ARM processors now without that much of a penalty. Uh, obviously your tasks will vary, so if you're trying to run Doom 2016 on this, then yeah, you might have a few issues. However, for lighter tasks, word processing, that type of stuff, then this might well be your gig. But, you know, we'll have to just wait and see what the future lies. However, I do also want to talk about the GTX 1080 Ti. This is not necessarily something that is going to impact the majority of you, because, well, it requires liquid nitrogen. But it is pretty impressive, because we are seeing a record-breaking performance here. Previously, the Titan X managed to hit 2.5 gigahertz, but... Now, we have managed to achieve the rather lofty figure of 3GHz from the well-known overclocker Kingpin. 
Just to put this into any level of perspective at all, if you start hitting 3000 megahertz, well technically 3024 if you want to be precise, you hit 229.3 gigapixels per second of pixel fill rate. Texture fill rate, however, is just a measly 583.7 gigatexels. What in the hell? That is absolutely crazy. By the way, the GTX 1060 Hall of Fame had managed to hit 3012 megahertz, but in terms of high performance cards, obviously the um, Titan X was definitely the uh, creme de la creme. So how have they managed to achieve this? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. The first is that, well, it's liquid nitrogen, so, you know, that pretty good. And the fact that the PCB had been modified. So the new PCB had been modified with 250 amps of power, and we've got an eight-phase dual effect design. In short, the Founders Edition of the GTX 1080 Ti is pretty much built from the ground up to be able to be overclocked extremely well. And so naturally, if you start putting that combined with high, uh, highly infused overclockers, the performance can get a little bit crazy. Honestly, this is not exactly, you know, going to set your world alight necessarily. If you're just a standard, um, you know, just using the standard reference cooler, you're probably not going to get anywhere near close to these clock speeds. And once again, it is using liquid nitrogen, so it's not something you're going to be running 24-7. But just the sheer principle of running this, or the fact that the cards actually can run at this speed, is kind of a testament to the engineering that goes in behind the scenes on these cards and really what they can do if they're given the opportunity to do it. A slight aside, a number of people, I'm going to probably say around the two dozen mark, have messaged me regarding Ryzen news. So here's the deal. Um, we're currently running an X370 Asus board um, which is the X370 Prime Pro for our Ryzen test rig. However, as a couple of folks know, we're having some BIOS issues with that, and there is a new BIOS which is supposedly being worked on over the next few days. However, we were get we had MSI reach out to us and ask if we could kindly take a look at their board, which is one of the high-end premium boards. So we've agreed to that, and they've actually sent it. We've got the board. It's actually at Amy's house right now. We're currently finishing off another review, which is of a GTX 1070 from Zotac. That's the AMP edition. So essentially, once that's finished, I need to capture the results tomorrow. I'm going to tear down that system and then build the MSI system. Uh, because MSI have basically asked us to run it with their 1700, and they really want us to show off the Wraith cooler, which they're providing us, as well as the board's features and stuff. So I figure I'm probably going to do that as a point of comparison as well. A number of people have also messaged me asking to take a look at the latest Windows build regarding uh, resolution and if it's fixed the performance. So I figure since MSI have sent this over um, and we've got a fairly short time to get this out because they've got a quite a tight review schedule, basically um, I figure I'm just going to handle everything at once and just get things over and done with. So I, I figured I'd rather get things done well rather than just rush it out, essentially, with kind of a bias that I'm not 100% happy with at the moment, if I'm totally honest. And the fact that I am hearing these reports about Windows um, updates improving the performance is definitely something I want to investigate before I do any level of review for Ryzen. My opinions still remain pretty consistent with the processor. I do believe it's a very good CPU, but there are definitely some issues with it. And you know we can argue all day long of what the problem is how that's happened and all that stuff and to be honest i don't really want to bog this video too much down with that but uh yeah i think you all know where i'm going with that anywho hopefully you've enjoyed the video um there will be a lot of stuff coming up in the next couple of days uh which is good because we're actually finishing some of the bloody reviews i've also not been around for much the last couple of days which is another thing i quickly need to mention for those wondering why I've not been messaging back, I had a friend coming over from Sweden for four or five days, so I was giving her the Grand Tour of London, and that actually kind of works out uh, well, because she actually went home very early this morning before the trouble in London, um, which I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about by now, so hopefully no one you know has been impacting everyone uh, you know, in your family and uh, friends list and whatever is safe, so... Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.